Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon for another very, very topical and compelling AMET webinar. Um, in approximately four months, um, the Iranian um, embargo for weapons trading is about to sunset um, on October 18th. Um, this is incredibly important um, as um, one of our wonderful esteemed guests, Mark Dubois, has, has said us, um, there is a, a report um, that one of FDD's colleagues, um, uh, Ben Wiedemer, had um, helped to assemble um, for German intelligence showing that Iran is amassing horrible lethal weapons. Um, and we know that the Trump administration is um, trying to extend this arms embargo. Um, but we also know that there are certain people in the Security Council, namely um, China and Russia, that are not in favor of this. Um, and we know, uh, moreover, that the um, European, many members of the European Union, if not all, um, will be against this. And they were upset with President Trump for um, nixing the JCPOA, the Iranian nuclear deal. So we're very afraid that when this um, arms embargo sunsets, um, this will open up the door um, for a tremendous trade in lethal weapons with Iran. Um, so I, and I should also let you know that um, as recently as this past Monday, um, the um, director of the um, IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Administration, um, Mariano Grossi, um, demanded that Iran open up um, its, uh, all of its sites for nuclear inspections. So there are at least two that he mentioned that have not been opened up. So we know that they are not playing by the rules, and we, and we know that um, some of these deals in the J JCPOA are about to sunset, or agreements of the JCPOA, rather, are about to sunset. Um, and we have two of the, the most wonderful experts here to discuss this. Um, Mark Dubitz is the chief exec executive of the Foundation for Defense of Democracies here in Washington. Um, he is one of the world's, I think, most paramount experts on Iran's nuclear program and its global um, terrorist network. And he's widely recognized as one of the key influences in shaping policies to counter the threats from the regime in Iran. Unfortunately, the Iranians know that as well. And in 2019, Iran sanctioned Mark Dubowitz and FDD, calling them, quote, um, the designing and executing arm of the U.S. administration on Iran policy. Um, th these threats led to a bipartisan condemnation, including from President Trump, President Obama, President Bush, and President um, Clinton, and their administration officials. Um, according to the New York Times, Mark Dubowitz's campaign to draw attention to what he saw as the flaws in the Iranian nuclear deal has taken its place among the most consequential ever undertaken by a Washington think tank leader. And according to the Atlantic, um, Dubowitz has been helping design and push forward sanctions on Iran since well before they became the centerpiece of Trump's policy. Um, he's establishing um, the Foundation for De Defense of Democracy as DC's ground zero for research and policy recommendations aimed at highlighting and fixing what Mark saw as the flaws in the nuclear agreement. Shoshana, as senior director of the Jewish Policy Center and editor of In Focus Quarterly. Um, she's a specialist in US defense policy and Middle East affairs and senior director for security policy at, had been senior director an executive director um, for JINSA and senior director for security policy at JINSA. She's worked with the Strategic Studies Institute of the US Army War College and the Institute for National Security Studies in Tel Aviv and lectured at the National Defense University in Washington, DC 
and um, the American Service Academies. Shoshana coordinated programs for military professionals that allowed more than 450 American military officers to engage in discussions with counterparts in Israel and Jordan. She's also created a program to take the cadets and midshipmen of American Service Academies to Israel, permitting hundreds of future officers to have a positive um, in-depth experience of the Jewish state. So thank you very much um, to both of you, esteemed, esteemed colleagues, um, for joining us today. Um, so Mark, um, what is next in the Iranian portfolio? Great. Right. Um, Sarah, thanks so much for that very, very kind invitation and introduction. Um, I think everybody should probably put their phones on mute. Um, their Zoom lines are mute now, that's better. Um, and thank you for everything that, that you do at, at Emmet to tell the truth in this era of disinformation and misinformation uh, and fake news, as it were. And a real pleasure to be uh, sharing the platform with Shoshana, who's been an old friend and someone I've admired for, for many, many years. So let me, uh, let me start off by framing the nature of the problem uh, and then talking about some of the actual policies that are being implemented by the administration and with some support from Congress. Now, it's worth taking a step back and really reminding ourselves why this Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, this Iran deal, was so fatally flawed to begin with, something that President Trump recognized even on the campaign trail uh, and certainly did something about back in 2018 when he withdrew the United States from the deal. The, the reason the JCPOA was so fundamentally flawed is because it is a deal that gives Iran patient pathways to nuclear weapons, to intercontinental ballistic missiles, ICBMs, uh, to regional dominance and to a economy that would increasingly be immunized against our ability to use economic pressure in the future. And the reason that there are patient pathways to that fatal Iranian end state is that the deal itself contains, Sarah, what you mentioned, which are these sunset, uh, provisions. What that means is essentially the restrictions that were put on Iran's nuclear program, on their ability to develop ballistic missiles, uh, in, in their ability to import and export conventional weaponry, would sunset, would expire, would disappear over time. And within a period of 5, 10, 15 years, depending on what provision you were talking about, Iran would be able to emerge with an industrial sized nuclear program with near zero nuclear breakout, with an advanced centrifuge powered clandestine sneak out capability. It would be able to develop ballistic missiles to threaten US forces in the region and our allies like Israel. And increasingly over time, these ICBMs that could threaten the American homeland. Um, it was the beneficiary of hundreds of billions of dollars in sanctions relief and economic relief which it used to not only rebuild its economy, but also to rebuild its force posture in the region, to fund the Revolutionary Guards, to fund the Quds Force, and to give the late Qasem Soleimani, the head of the Quds Force, the resources he needed to continue his regional project of, of domination. And I know Shoshana is gonna talk about that and about the, uh, the consequences of cutting off that funding to that regional project. And Iran, of course, uh, after the JCPOA, all they had to do was be patient. Um, in fact, there was a whole discussion about whether Iran would violate the agreement. And of course, Iran had no need to violate the agreement. All they needed to do was wait for these restrictions to sunset or expire, and they could emerge with what I've described and, and get to this lethal Iranian end state, where 10 years from 2015, um, our ability to confront Iran at that time would have been more costly and more painful because we would be dealing with a much more powerful Iran, a, a larger nuclear program, an arsenal of ballistic weapons, a conventional military with attack helicopters and fighter jets and tanks and battleships. And Iran, again, would have a stronger economy, which if it was producing growth rates of about 6% a year, which it did in the first couple of years after the JCPOA, within 12 years, the rule of 72 would say that the economy would double. And Iran would have almost a trillion dollar economy, a trillion dollar economy hardened against our ability to use peaceful pressure like economic pressure. So that was the JCPOA and that was the situation confronting President Trump when he came into office in 2017. 
Now, you've put your finger on, on one element of the nuclear deal that is really imminent um, and is very concerning, and that is the expiration of the UN Security Council resolution that set up an arms embargo on Iran, um, and that, was, that is set to expire this year. Now, the arms embargo in many ways demonstrates another fundamental flaw of the approach that was taken with respect to the JCPOA, because what it did in concluding a JCPOA, the Obama administration agreed to cancel multiple UN Security Council resolutions, uh, resolutions that prohibit Iran from enriching on its own soil and reprocessing plutonium. Well, of course, that was US policy for many years, policy that was supported by many of our allies, policy that was reversed as a result of the JCPOA when we gave Iran the ability to create fissile material on its own soil that it could use to develop nuclear weapons. One of only a few states in the world that has the ability to actually produce fissile material. While there are more than 20 states that have nuclear programs, civilian nuclear programs with peaceful energy and may acquire their nuclear fuel from abroad, we gave the leading state sponsor of terrorism the ability to produce fissile material on its own soil. Another problem, of course, is that the UN Security Council resolutions uh, imposed a permanent arms embargo on Iran. And that is an arms embargo that prevents Iran from procuring conventional weaponry from countries like Russia and China, as well as proliferating that weaponry to its proxies and allies in the Middle East and around the world. As a result of the negotiation around the JCPOA, then Secretary of State John Kerry agreed to impose a limited arms embargo of only five years of duration on Iran. So well, that, those five years are up. Uh, it's now up in October. And after the expiration of that arms embargo, Iran will be free then to buy all of the sophisticated weaponry from the Russians and the Chinese and build up its conventional military uh, to complement its asymmetric power through the Quds Force, which has already inflicted enormous damage to the Middle East uh, and to American interests. So there is an a initiative underway. Secretary Pompeo is leading it. Uh, they've already introduced a draft resolution to extend the arms embargo permanently at the UN. And of course, this is facing significant resistance from Russia and China, who would be the two biggest beneficiaries of the lifting of the arms embargo. It's also facing some resistance from our European allies, though they understand the problem and they're looking to try and find some compromise solution um, somewhere between the expiration of the embargo in October and a permanent embargo. They floated the idea of extending it by 12 months or 18 months, which I hope for the Trump administration will be a non-starter. So that's what we're facing in October. But I, I just want to, again, refresh everybody's memory because that's not all we're facing. If President Trump is reelected or if Joe Biden is elected as president, in his first term, he will face the expiration as well of the UN missile embargo. When that expires in 2023, Iran will be able to procure parts and components to, again, fully develop its missile program, including its ICBM program. Around the same time in 2023, Iran will be able to install advanced centrifuges which will give Tehran the ability to uh, power its enrichment facilities, but do so with a much smaller number of centrifuges because each centrifuge will be more powerful. You therefore would need fewer numbers. Therefore, they're easier to hide. And Iran would have an easier clandestine sneak out capability to weaponize uranium ultimately for a nuclear weapon. Two years after that in 2025, a number of the restrictions on Iran's enrichment capability go away. And over that time, Iran's breakout time, the amount of time it takes to weaponize one bomb's worth of uranium would diminish from one year, which is what it was at at the end of the JCPOA's implementation, to a matter of months and weeks. And as President Obama himself even acknowledged, 13 years after the deal's implementation, around 2028, Iran would have a near zero nuclear breakout. Now, again, I just want everybody to remember, this is by Iran following the deal not breaching the deal. This is Iran simply complying with the deal. They would get all of these strategic benefits uh, as a result of that. And that's what President Trump refused to give Iran, uh, all of these benefits, a patient pathway to nuclear weapons and ICBMs, regional dominance, and an economy, 
economy immunized against our ability to use economic pressure uh, as a result of just merely following the deal. So Secretary Pompeo has floated this, uh, this Security Council resolution to extend indefinitely the arms embargo. But he's made it also very clear in public statements that if the Russians and the Chinese block this at the Security Council, then the United States will move to snap back all of the UN Security Council resolutions that I mentioned earlier. Um, multiple resolutions on enrichment, on plutonium, plutonium reprocessing, on international sanctions, as well as on prohibitions on arms and uh, missile procurement. And this would effectively end the JCPOA um, because the Iranian reaction to that, as they've claimed, would be to walk away from the deal, potentially even to walk away from their obligations under the Non-Proliferation Treaty and their Safeguards Agreement. Um, but yet the administration, I think, rightly acknowledges that that is better than the alternative. It's better than having Iran continue to take these patient pathways to a lethal end state, as I've described. So intervening in this has been a recent report, as you mentioned, Sarah, from the IAEA uh, about Iran's refusal to allow weapons inspectors into two important sites. Uh, and as well to answer questions about their activities around a third site that they seem to have raised to the ground. Uh, these questions arise as a result of the incredible work of the Israeli Mossad, uh, which in a really daring operation snuck into Iran uh, and essentially took out a massive archive which detailed Iran's nuclear weapons activities uh, in the early 2000s. And that Iran nuclear archive, which is sitting in Mossad headquarters in uh, just outside Tel Aviv, a number of our experts have, have been there, have visited there, have been briefed on it, um, has seen the documents. It, what it describes is a massive uh, weapon, nuclear weapons program called the Ahmad Plan that the Iranians were uh, moving ahead with, uh, with the goal of, of developing five nuclear uh, bombs. And it raises many questions about activities, about nuclear materials, um, and the IAEA wants those questions answered. Unfortunately, as part of the JCPOA, there was a temptation in the Obama administration to say, the past is the past, we don't care about the past, we care about the future, and to only uh, look ahead rather than looking back. But of course, there's no way to ascertain whether Iran is complying with the agreement, whether Iran is clandestinely developing nuclear weapons, if you don't have a baseline of assessment. And the baseline of assessment is what has Iran done in the past? Where are these facilities? Where are the materials? Where are the scientists? Many of those scientists remain employed uh, by the Iranian uh, nuclear industry and by the Iranian government. And the father of Iran's nuclear weapons program, Mohsen Fakhrizadeh, uh, is still alive and well and gainfully employed in Iran's nuclear program. Where are these documents? Where are these scientists? Where are the materials? That's the question that the Iranians refuse to answer. And the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency's Board of Governors, uh, is now empowered to address the refusal of Iran to answer those questions. And we're hoping to see a resolution from the Board of Governors uh, condemning Iranian uh, nuclear mendacity and intransigence, and hopefully uh, that would move then to consideration by the Security Council. Okay, so we talked about the deal and its flaws. We've talked about the arms embargo and its expiration. We've talked about the possibility of UN snapback. Uh, we've talked about the IAEA sites and Iranian uh, nuclear intransigence. Let me let me talk uh, in the remaining few minutes about some of the steps that are being taken both by the administration and by outside groups to address this issue. First of all, there's been obviously a significant campaign both on the outside and by leading members of Congress to persuade the administration to snap back the UN sanctions. Now, part of the rationale we've explained, uh, an additional rationale is to try and address what, what I've called a um, wall of political and market deterrence. Uh, with the view that if President Biden wins in November uh, and he has claimed that he will return to a nuclear agreement with Iran, 
the, the rationale here is to make it more difficult for him to go back into the JCPOA, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, right? and, and keep that acronym in mind because I'm going to distinguish it from something else called the Joint Plan of Action, the JPOA, which was the 2013 interim agreement that the Obama administration reached initially uh, with Iran before two years of, of negotiations with them for the final agreement. So President Biden on his website, if you go to his website, and I urge you all to do this, um, if you go to the section on Jewish issues, interestingly, it's, it's Iran is put there, even though I, I would argue Iran is an American national security issue, not a Jewish issue. But if you go to that section of the campaign website, you will see carefully drafted language by President Biden that explicitly says that um, a Biden administration would return to a diplomatic agreement if Iran complies with its JCPOA obligations. And then has language there about Iran's regional activities and the use of sanctions and the importance of diplomacy and the importance of bringing allies along. But the, the Biden administration, I think, has been very careful in saying that they're not going to go back into the JCPOA, but that they'll go back into a diplomatic agreement. Now, what I think that means is that they are thinking of going back into the JPOA, the Joint Plan of Action, the interim agreement reached in 2013. Now, the interim agreement set the stage for what I think are, were the fundamental flaws of the final agreement. Um, by giving up enrichment up front, despite multiple UN Security Council resolutions prohibiting enrichment, by uh, talking about the idea of sunsets conceptually, though not delineating any specific period of time with respect to the, the sunsets, um, and also providing uh, some sanctions relief, but not the kind of enormous comprehensive sanctions relief that we saw with the JCPOA. So I think that the Biden administration's strategy now is to go back into the interim agreement, get Iran to comply with its JCPO obligations, which it's clearly breaching now as it builds up its nuclear facilities, and then use that to negotiate a new comprehensive agreement with the Iranians that addresses, hopefully, some of the fundamental flaws of the original agreement, including sunsets. I think the Biden administration has shifted significantly in its strategy, if that's what they intend to do, from what President Biden, or Vice President Biden, I should say, said on the campaign trail when he said he was going to go back into the JCPOA. And most of the Democratic candidates for president were saying the same thing, and many outside pressure groups uh, were recommending that's exactly what they do. I think they've acknowledged that, number one, the agreement was flawed. Number two, whatever you thought about the agreement in 2015, it'll be 2021, and many of these restrictions will be going away uh, during president a President Biden's first term. And number three, they're facing a sanctions wall of political and market deterrence. And this is what I wanna conclude with because I think this is where it's very important for Emmett supporters to be involved in this fight. Over the past three years, the Trump administration has very wisely re-architected the sanctions regime, which was a sanctions regime that previously had been predicated on Iran's nuclear activities. There were many nuclear sanctions and the most powerful economic sanctions were actually predicated on Iran's nuclear activities. What the Trump administration has done is take all the most powerful economic sanctions and reconceptualize them based on Iran's malign activity outside of the nuclear realm. So the Revolutionary Guards, uh, Iran's support for Hezbollah, its uh, human rights abuses, its support for terrorist organizations, if you look at many of the most powerful oil sanctions, central bank sanctions, sector sanctions, sanctions that are really inflicting massive pain on the Iranian economy today, many of those sanctions have been re-architected as non-nuclear sanctions based on the central bank support for Hezbollah and the Revolutionary Guards, the revenues from key sectors of the economy, including oil, that support the Guard Corps and the Quds Force and other terrorist activities. This is a message to the market a very, very clear message to the market that even if a Biden administration were to go back into the JCPOA and technically try to lift these sanctions, the underlying malign activity continues. And so if you get back into bed with the regime in Iran economically, you now are facing the, the reality that the central bank, the entire banking system, all of these sectors of the economy, the energy sector are all linked to 
support for terrorism and support to the Revolutionary Guards, which has been designated as, as a foreign terrorist organization by the Trump administration. That's bad for business. That's a significant reputational risk. It's a significant legal risk. So all of that technical work is being done and has been done and will continue to be done between now and November. But there is also equally a political wall of market deterrence that needs to be erected in order to keep companies out of Iran. And again, the reason you want to keep companies out of Iran, clearly, is you don't want Iran getting tens of billions of dollars of economic relief. So here's where Emmett can come uh, into the picture. Members of Congress have, int have uh, introduced a resolution uh, currently supported by 23 senators and representatives. Um, it was co-sponsored by Senators Cotton and Cruz in the Senate and uh, Representative Mike Gallagher, uh, I know a good friend of Emmett's and a good friend of ours from the great state of Wisconsin. And that resolution very clearly states uh, that there should be no return to the JCPOA and no sanctions relief until Iran satisfies fundamental conditions that are actually part of statute relating to its nuclear program, its chemical and weapon and biological weapons programs, its support for terrorism and other destructive activities. That is a message, a clear message, at least from the Republicans, and the more Republicans who support it, the better, that if a Biden administration goes back into the JCPOA and tries to give all the sanctions relief, the Republican Party will once again, as it did in 2015, stand steadfastly against that return. And that any company going back in will once again be whipsawed, like it was in 2016, 2017, and 2018, when Republicans take back the White House. So I will end with that. And that is an appeal uh, to all of you with your relationships on the Hill uh, to reach out to Republicans and to Democrats to support this resolution and help to fortify the sanctions and political wall of market deterrence to keep business out of Iran and to put pressure on a Biden administration or a Trump administration uh, not to return back to fatally flawed nuclear deals. Thank you. Excellent. Um, just, I, I usually don't do this, but just before we turn um, the speaker's platform over to Shoshana, I'm wondering what happened to the promised um, immediate snapback sanctions if Iran violates the deal that the Obama administration um, was promising us? Where did they go? Okay, so the, set the, snap back. the first set are all of the U.S. sanctions, um, which have been already snapped back uh, as of 2018. And obviously the Trump administration has layered on top of those old sanctions, uh, thousands of new sanctions and designations. So that has already been implemented by the Trump administration. Um, the Obama administration talked about another snapback, which is I think the one you're alluding to, which is really the, the U.N. snapback that the UN Security Council resolutions that I mentioned would be snapped back if Iran were to violate the agreement. Well, the argument that some former Obama administration officials are making, certainly the Europeans are making and others are making it, is that the United States is in no position to snap back those sanctions because the United States withdrew from the JCPOA in 2018. And so even though Iran is violating the agreement, they would claim we have no right to snap back. Um, what the Europeans have done is started a dispute resolution process, which is contained within the JCPOA to try and force Iran back into compliance. And they're supposed to, as a result of that dispute resolution mechanism over a period of time, if Iran doesn't answer the questions of the IAEA and get back into compliance, they are supposed to move to snap back. But the Europeans, of course, are not doing so uh, and are delaying any move. And I'll just conclude with this. The State Department's legal advisors have come up with a legal opinion that says that the United States may not be part of the JCPOA, but that the United States remains a party to UN Security Council Resolution 2231 that implemented the JCPOA. And as a party to that Security Council Resolution, we have the right to avail ourselves of the SNAP Act that's contained within that resolution. Um, and so that is the legal position of the Trump administration, that we can affect snapback, even though we've withdrawn from the agreement. It is a position that is rejected by our European allies and certainly by the, the Chinese, Russians, and, and obviously the Iranians. And that would set up you know, a major political fight at the Security Council 
if indeed the Trump administration follows through on its promise to snap back those sanctions if that arms embargo is not extended. So to further ensure that um, many of us will have nightmares tonight, <laughs> we are going to turn the podium over to um, our wonderful esteemed colleague, Shoshana Bryan, who will talk about Iran's malign activities throughout the region and the world. Thank you, Sarah. Um, it's always give, fun to give your people nightmares. Thank you, Mark. I learned a lot more. I always learn something from you. Thank you. I appreciate it. So I'm going to ask the question, why? Why do the Iranians want nuclear weapons? Clearly, they want them for regime um, survival. They saw what happened to Libya when Libya gave up its nuclear weapons. They saw what happened to Iraq when Saddam lost his nuclear weapons. And nuclear weapons are part of a plan for regime survival. They could survive perfectly well like everybody else if they didn't have nuclear weapons, except for one thing. And they also have a much bigger plan in the region and they need to protect themselves because they have a regional plan, which was to stoke as much instability as possible, as cheaply as possible, and to provide space for itself to execute its long-term plans for Shiite domination of as much territory as possible. So when you have a plan that looks out at the regions of the world and says, I want that, I want to control that, you better have regime security at home. And so you begin to understand nuclear weapons are a piece of a larger project. Some of which we understand very well, some of which I think is, is less clear. The concept of the Shiite Crescent, the land bridge from Iran through Iraq and Syria and Lebanon is pretty well understood, but it's not just a land bridge. It is in fact a lid on Iran's enemies. It covers the top of Saudi Arabia, the chief enemy because Saudi Arabia has Mecca and Medina and Iran wants them. It covers the top of Jordan, covers the top of Israel. It also provides a wedge between Sunni Turkey and the Sunni states of the Gulf and North Africa. So it's not just a land bridge, it's a wedge and it's a lid. Um, the countries in the bridge have been subject to years of Iranian undermining and wrecking. So Iraq is hardly a functional country but as a staging ground for weapons and militias that are going to move from east to west, it's necessary territory. Syria is mostly a dead zone, but as a launching pad for attacks on Israel, uh, it's a bonanza. Lebanon is a corrupt satrap of both Syria and, and Iran, governed by a terror organization, but it has a land border with Israel that makes it very, very useful. So each member of the Gang of Four across the Crescent maintains a state of war with Israel, threatens it on a regular basis. Um, periodically, there are Israeli attacks in Lebanon and in Syria. They are not an escalation of the situation. They are a defensive response to a high-tech military buildup that started years ago and that continues today. Sunni Hamas and Shiite Palestinian Islamic Jihad both receive Iranian arms and money and training. So that's the top side. There's also a bottom side and we don't pay enough attention to that. The underside of the Crescent encircles the Gulf states in Saudi Arabia, in the Gulf of Aden, with a base in Yemen, with a Houthi proxy, and it threatens to close the Bab al-Mandeb Straits at the bottom of the Red Sea. The Straits are the exit for Saudi Arabia, for Jordan, for Israel, for Egypt, out the Red Sea and into the Indian Ocean. Think about that in terms of Israel's trade with India, for example. Um, there's also the issue of the, the Suez Canal, Egypt's major source of revenue, empties into and takes traffic from the Red Sea. 18 miles wide, that's it. And Iran is sitting in Yemen, 18 miles wide. And on the other side of the 18 mile uh, Babel Mandeb Straits is Djibouti, which holds the only US permanent base in Africa. And speaking of Africa, there's more because there's always more. It's like a it's like one of those commercials on television, you know, and there's always something more. So there is something more. Look at Africa. Iran incubated Sunni Islamic Jihad in the second tier of Africa, the states of Sudan, Chad, Niger, and Mali, all of which are corrupt, they're poor, and they're a meeting place between Muslims in the north and Christians and tribal religions in the south. They are exceedingly unstable all by themselves. If you have instability there, 
and people are getting killed and people are unhappy, people move. And that's where you get the migrant waves, waves headed north through the second tier of Africa into the first tier of Africa, which is Egypt, Libya, Tunisia, Morocco, and Algeria, all of which were members of NATO's um, Mediterranean Dialogue Group, which was designed to keep the Mediterranean safe for traffic, for people, for trade. A lot of Israel's trade goes through the Mediterranean. Um, Libya dropped out. Libya had to drop out because the Obama administration in 2011 toppled the Libyan government, started a civil war that continues to this day, and now there is a popping of the cork between the second tier of African countries and the Mediterranean Sea. And that's where the migrants go, from the middle to the north, into the sea, um, where they're picked up by Europeans and they're brought north, providing destabilization to the southern tier and then the central tier of Europe. It's a lot of instability for a country that doesn't have that big an army. This is not Hitler, this is not a blitzkrieg across Europe, but yet the Iranians have been able with proxy forces and a little bit of um, money and some engineering and some threats to people's lives and, and wealth to create instability in the Middle East, in the Persian Gulf, in Africa, in the Mediterranean, and then into Europe. It may be too big because I don't only want to give you nightmares, I also want to suggest that there are other things going on here. Imperial overreach is a concept that we know. Imperial overreach was the ruin of the Roman Empire, the Byzantines, the Egyptians, the Ottomans, the Nazis, and the Soviets. They all overreached. The question now for Iran is, has Iran overreached? Have the mullahs overreached? Um, if you are Iran, 2020 is not your year. Aside from the protests, which began actually in the end of 2017, not the beginning of 2020, which the media would have you believe, but Iran has been under siege, or the Iranian government has been under siege by its own people since December of 2017. On top of that, however, beginning in November of 2019, people in Iraq began to rise up against Iran. Not just Sunnis, uh, uncomfortable by Shiite Iran and Shiite Iraq. In southern Iraq, where the Shiites are, the Iranians have been thrown out of Karbala, a holy city for the Iranians. Iraq just closed its thousand mile southern border with Iran. The new Iraqi government is protesting the stealing of Iraqi oil, the use of the Iraqi Central Bank, um, the use of Iraqi territory to break sanctions. Iraqis are tired of this. Now, whether their new government can put an end to it is not clear, but it's one more thing for the Iranian government to worry about. In addition, oil prices flirted with zero for a little while this year, having to do with the Russian-Saudi oil war, uh, and the demand drop from the virus. Oh, and I forgot to mention the virus. Yes, there is the virus. The Iranians are having terrible trouble controlling the virus. Um, so between the drop in oil prices and the drop in demand for oil, um, Iran is now exporting oil, I think, free. I mean, maybe they expect the Venezuelans to pay for it later, but the Venezuelans have no money either. They are exporting oil to Venezuela in hopes of reducing the surplus that lives in Iran. The Iranians tried to take on the U.S. Navy again in the Persian Gulf. Uh, it was for show. It wasn't serious. They put an imam on the front of the boat, and you don't put an imam on the front of the boat if you mean business. It was, it was for their own domestic consumption. However, it's very dangerous because a miscalculation by either the Iranians or the Americans can start a war in the Persian Gulf. Uh, in Germany, the Germans pulled the plug on Hezbollah, finally, after years and years of being Tehran's biggest supporter in Europe and Hezbollah's biggest supporter in Europe, Germany decided that was a bad idea. Uh, Mark alluded to efforts in the Congress to maintain the arms embargo. More than 390 members of the House and Senate uh, called for extending the international arms embargo. And I have to point out that one of the people who voted for the extension was Ilhan Omar in a step that I have yet to understand. In Iran, they canceled the Quds Day celebrations. They canceled the annual explosion of anti-Semitic, anti-Israel, anti-Jewish 
emotion that floods from the people every year. Um, they, were, they had to make do with a speech by the Supreme Leader who said all the things that he pretended the people were believing, but there was no Crude Day celebration. And in Syria, things are blowing up, and not just things. Serious things are now blowing up. Precision missile factories are blowing up. Um, IRGC leadership is blowing up. Hezbollah leadership is blowing up. And while Israel does not confirm or deny anything that happens in Syria, um, it's also true that Israel has red lines. And the red lines in Syria are three. One is to prevent Hezbollah from acquiring precision weapon systems or chemical weapons. Two is preventing Hezbollah and pro-Iranian groups from deploying along the Syrian side of the Golan Heights in the southern part. And the third is preventing the Iranian army from creating permanent bases in Syria for itself. So if you overlay the red lines on top of the things that are blowing up, what you conclude is that Israel is blowing up those things in Syria that violate its red lines. Um, that's a way of managing the situation. And add to that, by the way, the fact that the Russians and the Israelis deconflict on all of those things, and Russia has no apparent interest in saving Iran's capabilities or Iranian soldiers or IRGC people from blowing up. Um, you could conclude that Israel is dragging out the timeline or ensuring that the Iranians don't get where they want to be uh, in any reasonably short time. Is it the end of Iran in Syria? Probably not. Probably not. They've made a multi-decade investment in doing this sort of thing. However, they haven't got what they want. They're not likely to get what they want. Parts of their plan in Africa and in Europe are falling apart. Part of their plan to have the Russians do this with them is, is falling apart. And it gives you some hope and it gives you listeners some hope that you, know, you don't have to fall in bed drunk tonight to get some sleep. It's not all dark. It will become darker, however, if we don't listen to Mark and the things that the world community needs to do to keep the Iranians from having the regime security they seek. That's where I stop. I'm going to unmute myself. Thank you both for your brilliant, brilliant analyses. Um, and you both sent in questions that are wonderful, but I'm going to first um, ask you, another question um, that is really troubling me um, on, um, on my own, and I'm sure troubling most of the listeners, and that's America seems to be entering into this period of retrenchment and isolationism, um, which is understandable after protracted engagements in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, you know, we've seen various estimates till when Iran reaches nuclear breakout. Um, under a tr future Trump or future Biden administration, um, do you think that Israel will have to go it alone to take down this Iranian nuclear monster? Do either of you have any ideas about this? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm certainly happy to address some of it. I mean, we at FDD, our two biggest priorities at FDD are Iran and China. Um, so every day as CEO of FDD at a very small level, not compared to what our policymakers have to do in Washington, we're making decisions about how do we shift resources between our Iran portfolio and our China portfolio. And even in these, these days of COVID-19 and fundraising challenges, the question is, what do you do about China? Because China clearly is a significant threat. And that's where you see U.S. policymakers going. There is an isolationist wing of both parties, but I think the emerging bipartisan consensus is that the United States needs to pivot out of the Middle East into the Indo-Pacific and shift particularly military resources to confront a rising Chinese Communist Party and the threats that China represents, not only to our allies in that region, but to U.S. interests in the most, arguably one of the most important strategic and, and economic regions of the world. And I think that's very much driving the decision making. And it's really a tug of war between CENTCOM, Central Command, and Indo-Pacific Command over who gets the resources, who gets the, the new shiny uh, leading edge weaponry. 
So that's what you're seeing, I think, playing out. And I think the short answer to your question, Sarah, is yes. I mean, I think the Trump administration certainly, and I think a Biden administration as well, um, would see Israel taking on, at least militarily, the fight with the Islamic Republic, uh, even though we will be there always for economic pressure and diplomatic pressure and, and hopefully to support Israel in terms of intel gathering and you know, sharing uh, critical resources about Iranian operations in that region, which I, arguably the Israelis may not even need our help given their intelligence dominance in key countries. Um, but I do think Israel will, will have to go it alone militarily. And I think as Shoshana has said, they've done a pretty remarkable job to date of taking on the Iranians in Syria, but they are deeply embedded all over the Middle East and it is a huge undertaking for the IDF. Um, I would take a little bit of issue with the concept of isolationism. I'm not sure that's what it is. Retrenchment for sure. Uh, and asking the question, what can we hope to accomplish? So after 18 years in Afghanistan and how many trillions of dollars and how many lives lost, Afghan lives as well as American lives, I think the Trump administration has concluded that that is a civil war where we have no role to play. And that's not unreasonable. Um, that's actually the position Democrats took for a long time until President Obama changed their minds. In Syria, we looked at that and said, are we going to create a Kurdish state by breaking up Syria and giving the northern peace to the Kurds? And the answer was no. And since the answer is no, which kills me because I'm a, I'm a Kurd supporter, but, but the answer is no, we're not going to break up Syria on behalf of the Kurds, then staying there in the long term was not in our interest. I agree with Mark. Um, China has taken over. But here I think the United States and Israel are doing what they do best, which is cooperating on uh, technology, on capabilities, on how to confront certain kinds of threats. We're not talking about a land war. We're not talking about rolling the tanks into China. Um, I see a lot of room for cooperation for the United States and Israel. It's not gonna be in Afghanistan. It's not gonna be in Syria. But overall, I think so. We're not isolationist yet. We've just withdrawn from some treaties that didn't work for us, the multilateral agreements that didn't work for us. We'll get out of Afghanistan and we're mostly, but not completely, out of Syria. I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, so I'm now going to leave it up to one of my two wonderful staffers on the line to read the um, questions that have come in. Alana Margolis. Yeah. Hi. Um, okay. So the first question is, um, to what extent is Iran dependent on external resources to design and build precision weapons and drones? So I, I think Iran's precision guided missile program um, still remains somewhat dependent on, on parts and components uh, from abroad. Um, but I think the, you know, the bad news is they've really set up some pretty impressive domestic capabilities. And the, the precision, I'm glad the, the question was asked. I mean, when you ask Israeli military officials, strategic planners, um, what is this, the significant threat to their country apart from Iranian nuclear weapons? The answer is invariably Iranian precision guided missiles. And I think everybody knows these PGMs, their capabilities, their ability to inflict massive damage on Israel's civilian infrastructure. Um, as Shoshana said, this is the rationale for why Israel has launched hundreds of strikes, particularly in Syria, but as far away as Iraq, um, and even in certain occasions in Lebanon, is to try and target these precision guided missile kits and, and, and weaponry and transfers. Um, I, I just wanna add one other thing because I think Shoshana did such a good job of explaining what is an Iranian strategy that has been articulated as far back as the first Ayatollah Khomeini, but put in more precise terms by the current Ayatollah uh, Ali Khamenei, and which is a surround strategy. How do you surround Israel on every border? How do you surround the Saudis and the Emirates on every border? Um, and Shoshana did a great job of explaining that. I, I just want to point out that Ali Khamenei said a few years ago that his objective is to turn Tel Aviv into Seoul. What, what does he mean by that? What he means by that is he means that the North Koreans right, have created a situation where they've effectively surrounded Seoul with both conventional weaponry, precision guided missiles, 
and always the, the ever-present threat of, of nuclear weapons. And in doing so, they've undercut South Korean military capability. They've even undermined American, American conventional military capability. And that's why we have a standoff with North Korea and a problem that always seems to um, never be able to be solved using any instruments of American national power because the North Koreans could destroy Seoul in a couple of days. Well, that's exactly what Ali Khamenei wants to do to Tel Aviv. He wants to severely undermine the IDF's conventional capability and America's military capability in that region to come to even come to Israel's aid. And it's uh, important that you said Seoul and you're looking at North Korea because North Korea is the country that didn't give up its nuclear weapons. You could be Libya or you could be North Korea. If you're the Iranians, who do you want to be? You certainly don't want to be Libya. You want to be North Korea. And it's a great analogy. They get it. We don't get it all the time, but they get it. That's exactly right. And the Iranians don't even need nuclear weapons to actually achieve right. their objective. They need thousands of precision guided missiles in Lebanon, in Syria, in Iraq that can destroy Tel Aviv in a few days. Tel Aviv then becomes Seoul and Israeli and even American conventional military capabilities significantly degraded. Um, okay, thank you. Um, so we only have time for one or two more questions, but we're going to try to get to as many of uh, everyone's questions as we can. So the next question is um, for Mark. Uh, and the person wants to know, can you please elaborate on what basis you believe that the Biden administration wants to re-enter the JPOA rather than the JCPOA or some new agreement? Great question. So what, what I encourage everybody to do is go to the Biden campaign website. Um, again, it seems to be organized based on ethnic politics. So welcome to America in the 21st century. Um, so go to the, the Jewish section and then go scroll down to Iran and read the language. Now, the language is put on that website. I can tell you, having worked on campaigns and advised candidates, Shoshana as well knows this, like every word that goes on that website has been carefully vetted by a, a team of experts, in this case, a number of Iran experts that have been advising President Biden, they deliberately put in language that says, we will return, a Biden administration will return to a diplomatic agreement if Iran complies with its JCPO obligations. What they didn't say was, a, a Biden administration will return to the JCPOA if Iran complies with its JCPOA obligations. That would have been not only easy to write, but that actually would have been consistent with what Vice President Biden was saying early on in the campaign and what, as I said, most Democratic candidates for president were saying. We'll go back to the JCPOA. Trump made a disastrous mistake withdrawing from this multilateral agreement. That's not what they say. It's a diplomatic agreement. And I, I would just say, let me surmise based on um, conversations and information that what they have in mind is a return to this JPOA, this 2013 interim agreement uh, that is not as uh, egregiously flawed as the 2015 agreement, though I would say it sets the wrong framework for negotiations with Iran, given the fact that the interim agreement gave up the most valuable concessions on enrichment and sunsets um, two years before the, we, the US reached the final agreement. Oh, okay, so the next question we have is um, that Israel, the U.S., and neighboring countries in the Middle East recognize the Iranian ICBM as and nuclear programs as grave threats. Um, so where have the Europeans gone wrong, and how are they unable to see how they are targets to? Uh, yeah. the, the conversation about where the Europeans have gone wrong will take us the rest of the afternoon. Um, it should be pointed out that the, the ICBMs um, don't work. Yet the Iranians claim that they do, but according to US military intelligence, they don't. So we have a little time left on this, but the Europeans view of the JCPOA was that it allowed them to do trade with Iran in various areas. And if you look at German trade in particular, it happens at a great loss to Germany. They are in huge deficit to Iran because they import rugs and pistachios from Iran, but they export machinery. Machinery is a funny category. Okay, machinery, 
tells you that the Germans don't want to tell you it's lawn mowers or it's garbage disposals, it's machinery, it's a don't ask. So the Europeans have been fronting for this trade for years. Now they're getting caught in it. Now they see what the problem is. Um, it's our job, I think, to hold their feet to the fire, but expecting the Europeans to just do the right thing here, eh, unlikely. So while we're taking up the next question, I would just add to this. I spent a lot of time with the Europeans uh, over the past decade, particularly those folks in, in Paris, Berlin, and London who negotiated the interim agreement and the final agreement. It's, it's worth reminding folks that the French in particular had grave concerns about the JCPOA and about Secretary Kerry's negotiating prowess. Uh, and they were very candid about telling you that um, in very undiplomatic language back in, in 2015. But their view was once that agreement was reached, whether they, it could have been a better agreement, they believed it could have been. But once it was reached, they believed that was the best opportunity, the best framework to um, cutting off Iranian pathways to nuclear weapons. And they believe that so sincerely. So Shoshana is right. There's an strong elements and lobbies, both within these governments and outside, that are pushing for uh, trade with Iran, no doubt. But the experts within these systems, the nuclear and non-proliferation experts, genuinely and sincerely believe that the JCPOA, while imperfect, as they'll tell you, uh, was better than the alternative. We fundamentally disagree with them, but, but it's a view that is sincerely held by them. All right, so there have been a few questions that have come in that I might have to send you. We are coming to the end of our hour. I cannot thank either of you two magnificent experts enough for your erudition, for your deep dive into all of these issues for so many years, um, and really for your brilliant analyses. Tune in next week in case you haven't had enough nightmares um, when we will have Joseph Humeyer, who is an expert on Iran and Hezbollah's presence right here in the Western Peninsula, south of our border. Um, that will be um, next Wednesday at 12 p.m. and we'll send something out about that. Um, but um, thank you so much to all of our listeners. Again, I apologize if we didn't get to all of your questions. Um, and thank you so much, Mark Dubowitz and Shoshana Bryan, for your continuing diligence and brilliance. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.